We have a spectacular panel today. Um, we have people, every single one of the people who are seated there has won a Pulitzer Prize. And each one of them has spent the last couple of years or more reporting on the most competitive news story in the world, which is Donald Trump. Suzanne Craig is an investigative reporter at the New York Times. She writes about the intersection of money and politics, and for the past three years has been covering Donald Trump and his finances. In 2016, someone very kindly mailed her pages from, the, from Trump's 1995 tax returns, and this year, Craig, along with David Barstow and Ross Butner, won the George Polk Award and the Pulitzer for their investigation of President Trump and his family's use of questionable tax schemes over decades. Anthony. <laughs> Anthony Cormier is an investigative reporter at BuzzFeed News and is based in New York. And full disclosure, while I was still the investigative editor at BuzzFeed News, I hired Anthony, and I absolutely loved working with him. Anthony got his start in journalism loading newspapers onto delivery trucks and worked his way up. And when he was at the Tampa Bay Times before he came to BuzzFeed News, uh, he, along with Lenora LaPeter Anton and Michael Braga, won the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for an absolutely riveting investigation into Florida's broken health care system. So welcome, Anthony. <laughs> the reason he's here, I should say, is for more than two years of absolutely dogged reporting that began with reporting on Michael Cohen and went on through reporting many of the things that we'll talk about today. Michael Rothfeld is an investigative reporter at the Wall Street Journal based in New York where he and I very briefly overlapped before I joined ProPublica. Michael has worked on the paper's financial investiga investigations team and in its law bureau and he's covered everything from the aftermath of Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme to insider trading, for which he won a Polk Award. And he and a group of journal reporters just won the Pulitzer for uncovering evidence that Trump personally orchestrated a scheme to suppress damaging sexual allegations. So welcome. Suzanne, the first question is for you. You tweeted one of the best tweets ever. <laughs> After all the months and hard work that you put into this story, you went to the Times printing presses <laughs> to watch your story literally roll off the presses. And that story, of course, was an amazing excavation of Trump's tax scheme. So I actually have two questions yep. for you. The first is, why did you go to the printing press? And the second is, <laughs> what did you learn in this incredibly long story about Donald Trump? This is a panel about reporting on Trump, so what did you learn about Donald Trump? Okay, so the first question. I, there was, I just really, after 18 months where we just slaved over that story, I just couldn't imagine not being there to see the press start. I, when I had my first story you know, 30 years ago, uh, my first front page story when I was in the Calgary Herald, I went and it, uh, that was an amazing situation because the printing press was like in the building, but I went to watch my story run off the front page and I just, or off the press, and I just couldn't imagine not going out. It was a pretty long evening because the presses don't start running until 1 a.m. and I had to be up at 6 a.m., but I'm really glad I did it, yeah. It's great. It's great. And what did you learn about Trump? So much. Um, you know, when we were, when I think about sort of where to begin with sort of all the things that we took away from the investigation, I think when, when Russ and David and I were working on this story, we, we came to describe 
the, one, one of the main things we learned about Donald Trump is the foundational lie, and that's the idea that he was a self-made billionaire. It's so important to who he is, and he ran for president on it. And the, the understanding that he, you know, I think we all knew that he inherited or he received more than a million dollar loan from his father, but once we started to realize just the, the tens and the hundreds of millions of dollars that he received over his lifetime from his father, when you see that it started when he was three and it just continued and grew and grew and grew, and then you go back and you look at, he spent his entire life pretty much from the time he was in his 20s carefully crafting this lie about his fortune. And to see the efforts that he went to to not only um, you know, begin that, and we mentioned in the story, there's a New York Times article from 1976 where he's taking the New York Times reporter around and you know, we would go through that story and we just couldn't believe you know, he would be showing him one of his buildings. Well, in fact, it was one of Fred's buildings and another one of his jobs and it was something that Fred had done. And the, the immediate appropriation in his 20s of that wealth and then going to diminish his father's wealth later in life, oh, he was just a guy out in Brooklyn and Queens. And to see that and then just to understand a, a man who today is in the White House and to see his behavior and then to know you know, he really, for his whole life, he not only went to those great lengths to create that narrative, that false narrative about himself, but to know that every bet he's ever taken in his whole life, Fred Trump had it covered. And that's pretty incredible just to understand the sort of risks that somebody like that might take. Um, and I think you start to sort of understand a little bit of his, I think, his behavior. And, and then I think the most sort of the thing I remember most about the story in just terms of an anecdote that tells you so much about Donald Trump was in 1990, um, this part of the story where he is, you know, at his, his depths of his, you know, just financially he's on the rocks, his casinos are going under, he's broke, he's, you know, losing money, the banks are coming after him. And in December 1990, he sends a lawyer over to his father's house to try and change his father's will to his advantage. And I think if I ever sort of thought about just a defining anecdote about somebody's character, it's that moment. He didn't succeed, but the fact that he would do that, he would do that just says so much about him. Thank you. Yeah. So Anthony, using exclusive documents that really nobody else had, and obviously a lot of sources as well, you and Jason Leopold reported on this astonishing variety of people in Trump's world from Michael Cohen, Felix Sater, Paul Manafort, and of course you reported on his, maybe his most, what shall I say, uh, well, he reported on Trump Moscow, a 100-story tower that he wanted to build in the heart of Moscow. What did you learn about Donald Trump from all of that reporting that began shortly after the election? I mean, it's shocking to me still the brazenness with, with which he will lie, uh, it, it, especially when there's knowable, discoverable evidence that exists to disprove his lies. He's on the campaign trail in 2016 and in the early months of, of his presidency denying that this project existed, that it was, they had no deal, there was no Moscow, there was no nothing, when in fact we, had a, we were able to obtain a whole cache of documents that proved, yes, indeed there were. You, you, in fact, signed documents. The people that worked at the Trump Organization amended contracts to be more favorable to you. Um, it's still a bit stunning to me, knowing that all of that stuff is out there, and that some muckraker idiot like me is going to eventually find it, that you would go out and, and, and sort of stick to this line, this script that you just know is going to unravel uh, at some point is a, is a still remarkable thing to me. Michael, you were like a pit bull with a bone. You got this story a few days before the election about the hush money, and you just kept chewing on that bone. So what did you learn about Donald Trump from all of that reporting on his hush money payments? Well, when you're considering writing about a porn star or a Playboy model in the pages of the Wall Street Journal, very serious newspaper, people might say, well, that's a salacious story. Why would you publish that? So from the beginning, we saw this and framed it as 
a story about an effort to deprive the public of information. And what it revealed was the, the steps that Trump and the people that he relied on were willing to take to suppress that information. So the first story about Karen McDougal, a Playboy model, being paid $150,000 by the National Enquirer to catch and kill her story, which we published four days before the election, um, that was uh, something that we, you know, we saw someone who, David Pecker, the head of the National Enquirer, doing Trump's bidding. Um, and we continued that reporting until we reported on uh, his personal lawyer, uh, Michael Cohen, paying $130,000 also in that same period of time. This was a period of time when uh, all the allegations about women were coming out against Trump. The Access Hollywood tape had been published, so they were very concerned about not having more information like that come out, and they were willing to pay these women to uh, basically silence them. So that, that shows the steps Trump's willing to take, and it also shows how he uses other people in his orbit to do dirty work for him, which is something that we also recently saw in the Mueller report about all the people that he asked to do various things. It didn't always work out because, as it turned out in, in those cases, a lot of those people ignored what he was asking them to do. But historically, I think going back to Roy Cohn, he's had fixers who have been willing to do things for him based on what he prizes as loyalty. You know, so, but the loyalty, as it turns out, runs really in one direction. It's loyalty to Donald Trump. It's not loyalty going in the other direction. Thus, Michael Cohen is going to prison. David Pecker uh, at the National Enquirer has suffered severe reputational damage. But I mean, Donald Trump was tarnished by this. But obviously, uh, you know, he's he's still intact and going forward. So, Anthony, I think everybody wants to know about that story, and. Uh, I'm going to get to that story, but I think there's no way to, and this is the story about Donald Trump directing Michael Cohen to lie uh, to Congress. But before we get to that, I'd like you to kind of set the stage because there was some remarkable reporting that you did about the substance that Cohen would go on to lie to Congress about. So talk to us about the Trump Moscow Tower story and what essentially you found out that Michael Cohen lied about? Well, I mean, during the campaign, and again in, in the early months of his presidency, they maintained pretty strictly that this deal to build this gleaming tower with his name on it uh, on, a, on, a, on the riverbanks in Moscow was not true. There really was just a you know, glimmer in their eye. It was a flicker of a thing. Uh, they maintained that, that party line. Um, pretty significantly, right, right down the middle, all the way through 2017, I believe. Uh, and so we learned by obtaining several hundred documents from inside the Trump Organization, inside some of the players, the developers in this deal, that they, in fact, were very, very interested in building this. And in fact, in the Mueller report more recently, uh, the president thought of his campaign as an infomercial to build the tower. Uh, they, they had hatched this plan, Michael Cohen and his uh, compatriot, Felix Sater, uh, to actually give a $50 million penthouse in the tower to Vladimir Putin to, to grease the skids to get the deal done. Um, that, to me, is a deal. It looks like a deal. It quacks like one and walks like one. It, it is. Uh, and we were able to, using this set of documents, publish a series of stories that showed how detailed the negotiations were. In fact, they were talking about the fact that Michael Cohen didn't just hatch this $50 million penthouse deal. He, in fact, talked to Russian officials about it. Um, so you know, we, we were able to show the, de the, the, the lengths that they had gone to sort of negotiate this and build it, or at right. least get close to building it. And, uh, and you even had architectural drawings, sure. which I was quite impressed with, and also the, you, you, you essentially using text messages and emails, you showed that the negotiations did not end in January, right before the first primary, but in fact continued on and through June. And that, I believe, was the substance of the, the, and the essence of the lie to Congress that Michael Cohen um, told. And so then you came out with a story that said that President Trump directed Michael Cohen to lie. And after it published, the special counsel, 
which virtually never comments, I think he's known as no comment car, uh, issued a one sentence statement uh, that said BuzzFeed's description of specific statements to the special counsel's office and characterization of documents and testimony obtained by this office regarding Michael Cohen's congressional testimony are not accurate. Which was very hard to parse, but nevertheless sent Twitter all a Twitter. Um, and then the saga only got more interesting after Cohen publicly testified to Congress saying that he had been given code words by Trump that he interpreted as instructions to lie. And then the Mueller report coming out and saying that it did not have evidence to establish that Trump directed uh, Cohen to lie. So what happened and what's your take on it now? What happened? Uh, I caused a lot of trouble. The principal got really mad at me. Um, so what we, so we've been, we have really good sources, um, and they t showed us documents. And I'm safe to say this now, even though the government's former main leak hunter is in the room. I'm sure you're not going to, we're off the record, right, man? <laughs> uh, they shared with us documents, contemporaneous notes, taken during interviews with Michael Cohen, in which he told the team of investigators that he felt he was directed to lie. He was instructed to lie. Now, the, character, the, the interpretation of that word directed mm -hmm. is, is at issue, as is the word explicit. Because in my story, I use the word explicit. And in fact, it wasn't explicit the way I'm telling you, hey, so go lie for me, Sue. Because that's not how the president talks, right? He uses code words, much like a gangster, to be honest with you. And in this case, Michael Cohen interpreted those words to be a direction. Go do this. Except that he didn't say, hey, Mike, go lie. So therein rests the entire sort of story, right? And it's my job as a journalist to get that right, and I didn't. Right? I didn't get the words perfectly. And I took a beating for it. Um, it just, I mean, absolutely was crushed. I mean, it's, it was an interesting moment for me because I got to take a look at how the sausage is made from the mainstream media, right? Like I'm, Started on a loading dock, man, and all of a sudden, like they're telling me that I'm a black eye on American journalism, and it's a dark day, and you know, like I've I've sullied my my profession and my reputation, and you know, um, so all that was fun, um, and I but I actually learned that it's like not like I'm not in a fetid cell in Myanmar, I'm not Jamal Khashoggi, right? What happened to me is a mere pittance because Brian Stelter and Twitter yelled at me because I said a truth that my, that my sources believed is, is nothing. It's, it's, it's this. It, it matters nothing. It was a whole lot of fun to go through, let me tell you. Like, you know. Whatever. But you found some perspective. Of course, you have to. I mean, I was going to go change my name so that my kids weren't embarrassed by me. I mean, Saturday Night, I'm the punchline of a Saturday Night Live joke. Right, like that's that is the that's the place that I existed for a moment, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the, we just reported through it, right? Because because the president and Rudy Giuliani says the day after Mueller spanks us, there's no deal, there's no deal, and so we said, excuse my language, fuck it, here are the receipts. Mm -hmm. And so rather than tweeting through it or talking through it, we just kept reporting. We had all this material, and we said, you know what? We're going to keep going. We're not going to stop. Doesn't mean that we we don't have to sort of atone and learn what we did and, and make sure that we sort of understand how that happened. But like we just reported through it, which is I think my job. So. Thank you. Yeah. So this is a room of journalists. So we want to know your sources, <laughs> or at least how you sourced. Um, Michael, one of the most amazing passages in many, many amazing stories that you wrote, I'm just going to read it aloud because it's just kind of delicious. Um, so this is in the middle of, of kind of your big, and having been at the journal, I kind of know how this works, like it's coming toward the end of the year, Michael, where's that wrap-up story that's going to put a nice bow on it? So it's, the end, it's that story. Yeah. 
and it's discussing kind of Michael Cohen and his sort of, you know, uh, interactions with uh, Mr. Pecker, the, the, the catch and kill guy. So it says, concerned that Mr. Pecker might leave American media, Mr. Cohen wanted to buy other materials the company had gathered on Mr. Trump over the years, including source files and tips. In a meeting at the Trump Organization offices in early September, Mr. Cohen told Mr. Trump of his plan. Mr. Cohen, who complained to associates about Mr. Trump's frugality, was also worried his boss would balk at reimbursing Mr. Pecker. He secretly recorded Mr. Trump discussing the deal. Quote, um, I need to open up a company for the transfer of all that info regarding our friend David, you know, so that uh, I'm going to do that right away, said Mr. Cohen, according to a copy of the audio file. As Mr. Cohen explained his plans, Mr. Trump spoke over him. So what are we going to pay? 150? Mr. Trump asked. Mr. Cohen paused and replied, yes. It's pretty rare to be in the room. So how did you get that file? What else did you learn from it? And just talk in general about the sourcing that you had to do to sort of bring these stories home. Well, I mean, in full disclosure, that audio file had been out there because, um, you know, it was seized by the FBI during a raid of Michael Cohen's offices and hotel room um, and his apartment. And so um, I believe the New York Times reported the existence of that, and then I, I, somebody leaked it to CNN, so it had been played. And so, you know, we used the, the, that conversation as part of a reconstruction of the entire history of Trump's involvement, uh, as you mentioned in the kind of capstone uh, article, uh, kind of uh, as like a, uh, on all of our reporting about the two hush money deals and the investigation of Michael Cohen and everything that it led to. And so, you know, our idea was to show Trump's direct involvement in those deals because he had been denying, I mean, from the beginning, recently I went back to look at um, the first email that I sent to the White House um, about the Karen McDougal deal, and you know, which was it was it was distanced from Trump because David Pecker, who was an associate of Trump but wasn't like you know part of his team, um, paid the money. So I asked them, you know, was Trump you know what's Trump's knowledge of this? Was he involved? So this is going back to 2016. It seemed clear that he was involved, but we didn't know at the time that Michael Cohen was and that Trump also was. So as time went on and we reported more and learned more, we wanted to report, okay, what was Trump's involvement in every step of, the, of these two deals? And we're able to establish through both stuff that was had already come out, like that recording, which has Trump on tape talking about trying to buy back the rights to Karen McDougal's story of having an affair with him from the National Enquirer, which a deal that never went through, and then reporting around it to people who you know, know about all the conversations and tr trying to amplify so uh, those that cases, with detail. Give us, give us an example of sourcing up one of those people who knew about those conversations and the time it took and how you did it. You don't have to give away the, the name of the person. Right. But let's sort of get into the actual art of sourcing and getting the goods. Yeah, I mean, everybody has a different um, agenda, but you'd basically want to, uh, what we, you know, in general would have done and did is you would talk, try to talk to everyone who could know about the events that you're reporting around and, you know, both directly and also secondarily, like from people that those people have spoken to, people who might have access to documents, people who might have access to government interviews that were given um, and know what certain people might have testified to. David Pecker testified in the grand jury in the investigation of Michael Cohen. Can you find out what he told the grand jury? You can use those details then to reconstruct scenes in your story, which is what we tried to do. Um, and then, you know, you also have to make sure that you're not relying too much on one particular person's account because one person's account could be wrong. So you actually need multiple people to corroborate that stuff. But the way that you approach each individual source is going to be different depending on who that source is, how are they positioned, what's their agenda, what's their incentive to talk to us, and, um, you know, or just how willing they are to talk to reporters, which, you know, sometimes 
people just, you know, it's hard to know. They don't always have a reason. Um, sometimes they just enjoy talking to us, and, you know, that can be very helpful. Indeed. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Suzanne, one of the, the, um, the, the things that I enjoyed most about your story, uh, and I think this is a kind of nerdy thing, but I'm probably in a room with one or two nerds, was the all-county boiler receipt. <laughs> um, all counties seem to be an incredible treasure trove for you. So first of all, just tell them a little bit all county and then sort of run with this idea of how you sourced up. Choose, if that's not the best example, choose a great example of like how you had to kind of nurture a source along. I think I, I can do both. All county was um, great just for a lot of, and, it, and it, we were able to do it both through sourcing and through public documents. But All County was this company that was set up in 1992 by Donald Trump, um, his siblings, and a favorite uh, nephew of, uh, of Fred Trump. And by 1992, Fred Trump is getting old, and there's a concern if he dies, you know, about his estate, you know, in total. But he was also sitting on not only all these buildings that he owned, but a huge amount of cash. Unlike his son, he did not have a lot of debt. He had, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of cash in addition to the buildings. And this company was um, set up with the intent they wanted to, the children wanted to take the cash from the father and move it into this company. And what they did was, it's incredibly just sort of almost like a soprano-like operation that they set up. Fred Trump had a lot of buildings. He had to buy a lot of stuff from boilers to bleach to paint to, you know, stuff for the roofs. And they, he would go out and buy it from, you know, Long Island Wholesale, you know, Home Depot, whoever. And all of a sudden, instead of all these buildings buying it from these these companies, one day it just the flip, you know, the switch flipped, and he was buying it, or the stuff was being bought from all county. The only difference was instead of paying ten dollars for bleach, all of a sudden they're paying thirteen dollars, and the kids just the markup just went right down from Fred to the kids, and they split it with the, with the nephew. Um, and this went on over and over again, product after product, fridges and stoves, um, from the boilers. On down, and they they were able to draw all this money down with the goal of avoiding this estate and gift tax, which at the time was um, was 55 percent. Um, and we were able to triangulate it. We got um, we had both the source um, who initially kind of twigged us to it, and then we were able to piece it together through a lot of public documents. We got one of our first hints about the significance of All County when we saw when we first saw an unredacted version of Marianne Trump's. Uh, a disclosure form she had made when she was being confirmed as a judge. And at the back of that, there was a line that said that she had received more than a million dollars over a certain period from this company called All County, which we knew virtually nothing about. So we were like initially like, what is that? And then we started asking around about it, and we got a fairly good sense of what they were doing. And then we were able Wait, to... you started asking around. So you just like, <laughs> I don't know, walked up to somebody here. How did Donald Trump work with all kids? Help us out here, Suzanne. Run with this. Well, I think one of the things that was interesting about the project is that we spent so much time, you know, to set, to set the table for that question. We spent a lot of time walking in Fred Trump's world. And we knew all of the companies that he had run, all of the buildings all of the um, names of the partnerships that the children had been set up to benefit from. So when we initially went out to source, it was a really difficult, um, like a lot of the doors that we knocked on, a lot of people had been there before us and the names were all pretty daunting. I always like laugh, I think I got like the worst draw, but we all got really difficult draws when you looked at the full names. But we had an advantage when we went to the doors, which was that we, spoke a language probably nobody else did, and that was this language and of so Fred you, Trump's you would, world. So you would typically, you would door knock, you would not call? Um, it, would, it would depend on sort of the approach, but I think initially we wanted to get to the doors of people. Um, right. We did, we, you know, we, I think we did a combination of both. Mm -hmm. But then as we, you know, there was no, nobody immediately invited us in, but after time and additional calls and, you know, we had the luxury of time, we got through to some people and, that's sort of where the, in one of the sources that we ended up you know, having a breakthrough with twigged us initially mm -hmm. to you know, sort of a little bit what, about what All County was about. And then it, it just continued to piece together. We got a, we got a boiler receipt. We you know, realized that was going on. And there was this great moment where um, the boiler operator uh, for one of the boilers that was bought was in the Bronx. And David went out to talk to him. And 
the guy's 90 years old and runs this, he's still selling boilers, and he invited David in, and he remembered the entire boiler deal. It was incredible, like the, how many boilers were sold to Fred Trump. And the interesting thing about it was they weren't sold to all county. They were sold to Fred Trump, handled by Fred Trump's employees. There was nobody at all county. And the first, he tells David, the first time I remember even hearing about all county was when the checks started rolling in. Right. So, yeah. You know, so many of people in Trump world are based in New York. Obviously, now many of them are based in Washington. But so much of his world is in New York. And, and both Suzanne and Michael had been uh, working in New York for a long period of time. But, but Anthony, you had not. You were working at what amounts to, with, no due, with all due respect to the, to the Tampa Bay Times, kind of a local paper. The best and, local paper. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, the best local paper. Uh, and then you came to New York, and I just kind of, quite frankly, watched in awe as you sourced up. And talked a little bit to us about that, because at the end of the day, not only did you end up with this incredible trove from multiple sources of financial, mostly financial documents, but also um, you know, incredible human sources. Mm -hmm. Um, so just talk about how, literally coming to New York, never having lived there before, moving there, finding schools for your kids, finding a place to live, figuring out what the hell BuzzFeed was, and sourcing up. Uh, nobody cares about all the moving in stuff. Right, but um, so get to the sourcing. <laughs> I mean, I, Donald Trump surrounds himself with some very strange people. Uh, and... You know, there are a couple of ways to get at this story for a reporter like me who is not steeped in Washington culture, hasn't been in New York, hasn't been in the national sort of a news, news organization for a long time, but knowing that this is a thing, this is an issue that you, my boss, were like, hey, just go figure that out for me. Um, so we, we decided there were two ways in. We could look for sources who other journalists don't have that may be investigating money, because we, we always sort of thought money, his financial situation, whether it was a building in Moscow, his personal finances through Deutsche, matters like that. So, so we, could, we could maybe find a, a way in there. And then we could also try to get inside of his inner circle, inside the people who are in the room when he makes various decisions. Um, my reporting partner, Jason Leopold, is much more adept at um, working the sort of government sources. He's done that. And I found myself able to talk to the group of complete weirdos who surround this man. Uh, and for some reason, they like me. Like you said earlier, I have no idea. I would never talk to a reporter. Are you crazy? Like, but these people do. Um, some of it was, I think, to set the record straight, because the president had, in fact, lied about them. I, we talked earlier about loyalty being a, a one-way street, and some of these sources uh, have felt that rather distinctly. Uh, and another was um, this sort of small thing inside their heads where they felt like, boy, this isn't normal. Like, I know that I'm in the room with the praise of the president, but still, this doesn't seem right to me. Uh, and so we were able to work with those folks over a long period of time. Um, some of them required late night phone calls, right? We all take calls at 2 AM. They would call, they would be drunk, and I would have to answer the phone. Um, others. Are, uh, are simply about um, taking them to the fanciest freaking place you can. So thank you for signing off on all of those really terrible expense reports. <laughs> um, but they, you know, I think the thing that we talked about a long time ago when, when he was my boss was you gotta meet sources where they live, right? right? It's, you gotta meet them where they're comfortable. And I don't know if that's potentially the, the, the place where the boiler room is, where the guy, if they ha it's their house, it's a restaurant, it's the Beverly Hills Hotel because the person wants to be seen at the Beverly Hills Hotel. It doesn't, it doesn't matter where you, you meet them, but you gotta go out and knock on their door and actually go to them. Like, where are they comfortable? Uh, where are they going to give you, um, you know, the things that, they're, 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 that you need to get? Um, so yeah, there's a, we, we just met them where they lived and asked them again and again and again and sort of played to that little patriot way back in their head to say, man, this, something about this is weird. He's lying about this deal. You know he's lying about the deal. There are documents that prove he's lying about the deal. You got to do something. Like, do it. Let's go. So that's, there's no secret sauce. It's just go knock on their door and 
and try to get them to talk to you. Okay, Mark, can, you I, know, just, can yeah, I just add please. on to that? You know, I think with many investigative stories, like ours didn't really um, emanate from the Washington or New York culture, but um, you really have to start building a source network from the ground up on a project. Like ours really came in as a tip about a lawyer in California traveling mm. the country paying off women for Trump, mm. which was ended up being Keith Davidson, who's a, a Beverly Hills lawyer who traffics in dirt on celebrities. And we, at that point, just dove into a world which was very unfamiliar to us, which was um, you know, paparazzi, tabloids, lawyers, and you know, just started making a list of people. Uh, and this is an, a slice of Donald Trump's background, this kind of underbelly um, of people. Did it make you want to work for the National Enquirer? <laughs> <laughs> no, but in fact, we would get many reader emails who would be like, Why? I read the Wall Street Journal not for stuff that I could read in the National Enquirer. And you know, the response would be, well, you actually won't read that in the National Enquirer. <laughs> That's great. One of the, you know, uh, one of the, uh, this is not a partisan comment. This is simply a fact that a lot of people around the president lie. Um, Michael Cohen, Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort, many, many, many others. So I assume, I don't know because I don't know your sources, but I would assume that many of your sources were not maybe the most truthful people you have ever met in your entire life. How did you kind of sift from all of these people who's to, for whom truth is a relative concept? How did you bulletproof your stories? Anybody can jump in for this. We, had a, we were fortunate that ultimately our story was so document-based that we, you know, the, we have to, there's a verification that goes on with the documents. But we didn't have to sort of, I don't, I don't think, come, like, come up against that in a way I, that other reporting has. But I have to tell you, one of the most difficult things just in terms of documents and tax returns in particular is the verification of tax returns because there's just such a small world ultimately that can verify tax returns for us. And we you know, struggle with that a lot. We get a lot of information in that we're trying to verify. And some of it, you know, we're still working to get to press. And, some of that we have gotten to press takes so long just because that process is, is really difficult. Yeah. Um, and that's like, I guess, when, we, when I think of the obstacles that, that we faced and that, that comes from that reporting, it's specifically on taxes and financial records, that's it. Yeah, um, yeah we had, so for, it, for the, both the Karen McDougal and the Stormy Daniels, it was different. Like in the, in the Karen McDougal story, we actually got a letter from this lawyer, Keith Davidson, like threatening us and saying, um, you know, I do not represent any women adverse to Donald Trump, which really wasn't true, although he may have seen a technicality. But we then subsequently got copy of the contract between the National Enquirer and Karen McDougal. And we also got his retainer agreement. So in that story, we had a document. Um, so we were very solid there. But with Stormy Daniels, we got a tip that um, Michael Cohen had paid her but the source did not know the amount. Uh, the source told us that um, uh, he had paid through a shell company but didn't know the name of it or um, where or when it was created, um, but did know a few generalized details. So what we sought to do was to corroborate that source's information by finding the shell company and talking to other people who could, uh, in a way, corroborate what that source said um, with independent knowledge of some of the things that we were told. So, you know, just using different disconnected sources to corroborate each other can insulate you from people who might lie. And then, you know, knowing who your sources are and what relationships you have with them. Um, and even, like, I've heard some people talk about once a source lies to me, you know, I know I can't credit anything they say. I think it's more subtle than that. Like when you know somebody well, um, and they have been reliable in some respects, you might know the areas where they are might tend to lie. Like they might tend to lie about things that pertain to them, but they might not lie about things that pertain to other people. And it, it is a difficult uh, dance to to know. But you know, when you do know someone well and you have a history with that person and then you also have other ways of corroborating it, that is a way uh, that you can do it. So here's another question that could be construed as partisan, but again, it's not. You know, 63 million Americans voted for Donald Trump, and I would assume that some number of them are in this room. Um, 
So when I ask this question, I'm not asking it from a partisan point of view, but rather from looking at past presidents. And if almost any past president I can think of had been hit with any one of the stories that you three wrote, let alone all three of them, it just seems that something more uh, would have, have, have happened. You know, and I'm, I'm gonna just sort of go through a little bit of, of things that, that, that you know, may, you know, like for example, Jack Schaefer called your story the bombshell that bombed. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I, I don't agree with that, but that's, that's what he said. And then, you know, Trump had survived the Access Hollywood tape. So maybe that's why nobody cared that he was also paying hush money. And, you know, um, even when, you know, uh, you proved that he was trying to build this skyscraper in Russia, for some reason it just doesn't seem to have cost him anything. I checked today on the 538 website and his approval rating is essentially unchanged and there doesn't seem to be a consequence. So why do you think that is? And what do you think that means for investigative reporting particularly about political figures or politics? So that's a two-part question, leap in. I think it does matter, so I'll go first. I would take issue with that. I think the stories that we write do matter because the truth matters. And I think it's how you measure it. I mean, you say would a president survive, so he's still in the White House, but I, I still think that even though he's weathered a lot and it's you know a pretty unbelievable environment we're witnessing that it does matter, and I think with our story, one of the, the greatest impacts I think it's had is it's soaked into the bloodstream of this country. I think you have a narrative that was out there that he was, you know, give or take, people believed he was you know, a self-made billionaire, and I think now you know that not only is he not, and that he received this just unbelievable amount of money from his father for his entire life, but that a lot of that was gained through tax fraud, um, and we were able to prove it you know, with documents from you know, their family, from Fred Trump's own bank records and tax records. Um, so I, I think it's, you know, the immediate impact was there wasn't an investigation and, and there has, the IRS hasn't um, you know, come after him, but I think it matters in a lot of ways that are, you know. Other so than I, that. Think it, I think it matters too, but I think it matters almost from a spiritual sense that the truth <laughs> matters, right? Like even, like even if you get crushed, the truth matters. But, and I don't mean to but, say but that, that this he, should mean that he gets impeached or something like yeah. that, but I just this think. This is that, the first cut like, of I'm history, gonna, though, and I think right, it, it. But it, I'm going to push back a little bit. Yeah. I absolutely think you proved your case. Like I came away from that story convinced, okay? But I don't see any evidence that it's sort of out in the vast swath of America. Like, I don't think that people say, oh yeah, he got $400 million from his parents and he, you know, and, 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 and I, I don't feel that. I could be wrong, yeah. but I don't, I don't personally feel that. No, I think in a sense, when, you, when you're looking at impact and you're measuring it by, was there a House investigation? Was there, has the IRS, you know, come after him? I mean, I think those things immediately didn't happen. But I also think that the story um, you know, has had and will continue to have impact as is, is the, the, the quest for more information on his finances continues in the House. I think the tax returns are hugely important and that is probably gonna go up to the Supreme Court and I, I think that that story has framed some of that debate as well. Mm. So I mean, I, I just, I think it's, I agree that there hasn't been the immediate, like he's still in the White House, but I think there has been uh, an important effect. I, yeah, I'm gonna I'm Team Sue because the stories that he and his partners have written, the stories that we've written, people are in jail. Like it may not have directly affected him, but I think his, his presidency has certainly been constrained by the, by the continued sort of dogged investigative reporting. And, and while he's still in the, he remains in the White House, Impeachment's not our job, I don't think. I mean, oh, no, you guys I want, want to give us the power, it's fine. But like, I, I, there's many ways but, of measuring. But if you look at his, his sort of the coder of people around him, like it mattered to them. Yeah, they're going to prison. Mm -hmm. Paul Manafort's going to prison. Papadopoulos is going to prison. Michael Cohen is going to report. Like, what day is it? Like May sixth. So I, I mean, it, I, 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 it's hard to for us to know in the moment. I think history will will judge us a little differently, right? I mean, our, the, these stories value, but 
But in the moment, people understand, okay, guys, he lied about the, the, this project. He paid off these women to keep their mouths fit. You're also saying it doesn't matter to a certain segment of the population. Is too, it ever going to matter to them? No. So I mean, like, I, I think with his base, it's not going to matter. But you know, it's harder to tell in the public consciousness, you know, in the middle of the country, what what. I mean, I think it, it definitely adds to the public consciousness. I, I, I recognize what you're saying because, in the days before we published the Stormy Daniel story, I told a few friends because I was excited, like, "Oh, the president's lawyer paid off a porn star. That's like a pretty good story, I think." And you know, and and you know, they said to me. You know, oh, nobody's gonna care. You know, he's Teflon, and I said, okay, we'll see. You know, and it, it blew up. It became an international story, and you know, I, and they were like, oh yeah, you're, you know, you're right because I think people did care. Um, I mean, Hope Hicks told us uh, about Karen McDougal. We don't know anything about any of this. Right. That was a lie. Trump had to answer questions on Air Force One that was, you know, videotaped and you know and widely disseminated. So just yeah. bringing this stuff to light, I do think it seeps into the public consciousness, mm -hmm. and I think that's important. Um, you know, and, and as Anthony said, I mean, people have paid. I mean, AMI took a non-prosecution agreement. That's significant. It, it shaped his. I mean, this not to be blowing our own horns, but it's shaped his presidency. That these things that we've reported are fundamental to who he is and how he governs. And so, you know, our check on that lie, on that mendacity, are, are these stories, mm -hmm. I think, I hope. So I will now disclose my own opinion. I, th I believe in the kind of slow accretion of truth. I don't think you land a story and then immediately things happen. So despite my adversarial tone, I kind of, I do kind of agree that, that these things do seep into the bloodstream. And we will see though, because I think it's a really, really interesting time where all reporting is, is um, you know, it's under a lot of criticism. Let's throw it open to questions. Who has questions? Do any of you think, uh, based on the sources that you've talked to uh, and the journalism that you've done so far, that there's another shoe to drop? You know, I, I thought the Mueller report was interesting, but it also confirmed what mostly had been reported before. Is there, is there another big story out there? And who are you? Identify oh, my name's David Bloomfield. Right. I'll take that one. Um, one of the things that I am committed to doing, my partner Jason Leopold and BuzzFeed News has committed to doing, uh, we're going to FOIA living hell out of every document that's related to that report, the Deputy Attorney General, the Acting Attorney General Matthew Whitaker, and Bill Barr, and the White House. So I, I'm not certain where the path will lead, but by sticking, but, but, looking at the documents that these people produced, I think we'll have a better understanding of how they characterized their investigation. I mean, I'm, I'm in, I would like to know, the Mueller report is, is a fascinating document. I'm more interested in it, not for what he said, but for what he didn't say, right? And go look at those footnotes. There are thousands of FBI 302 reports out there, and I'm gonna get them, right? Because I want to know what these individuals said to the FBI when they, when they turned the screw. What did they do? What, what charging decisions did, did Mr. Mueller make or not make? How were those based? Was, was the White House actually involved in any of these decisions? What was Mr. Barr's role? So I think that there, I, I, it's hard to know exactly where we're going to land, but there's, there's more reporting to be done. I'm keeping my eye on the documents that he definitely doesn't want anybody to see, and that's his tax returns. I don't think they're necessarily a Rosetta Stone to everything about his finances, but there's a reason he's fighting this hard. And, and yeah. it could be anything from simply he's not as wealthy as he says, and we're going to get some clues to that, to there could be serious sources of income there that we can finally see the hidden hand that has an influence on the White House. Um, I think they could be you know, pretty important should they come out. So. What, what about the PET? What about something like that? I don't know. I, yeah. It's a, are you looking at me for Every day is a... <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I, Mike. I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I, it's Who not knows? really... The, yeah. I don't think... I never went and tried to find... The, that's yeah, not a I'm thing. I'm not looking for the PP yeah. tape. Um, if it we'll shows up, it that would be it. interesting, but... No, no we'll, I, I mean, we'll take I, it if we, can, if we can verify I think there's real. always another shoe to drop. I mean, we have to start with the assumption that there's always more information that we don't know about. I mean, I don't know what it is yet. Sue? I'm Sewell Chan. Thank you for your digging in service of democracy. I'm curious about um, 
kind of the architecture of the legal environment that you're operating in. I'm trying to think ahead to two decades from now or three decades from now. Will a future authoritarian government try to limit the use of FOIA, the use of public records, limit the kind of work and the ability of people like you to do the work that you do? What regulatory policy and legal um, tools have you used as investigative reporters that we need to be aware of in terms of making sure they're protected and or even enhanced? You should, I mean, you do a lot of work with FOIA. I mean, I'd be so, I mean, I think BuzzFeed News um, has really been a remarkable organization uh, and has set up a fund to continue fighting our FOIA battles one by one. Um, I, you know, I'm not smart enough to speak to sort of the regulatory infrastructure behind it, but I know that they're chipping away at it. Um, and it's our position that we should, where we can, take everything to court, bring it in front of a judge. Let the judge make the decision, not the government, right? And so, so our, our sort of position has been, we know these documents exist. We believe that, unfortunately, we don't believe that the government maintains, the, 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 the documents don't belong to the government. The information doesn't belong to the government. It belongs to us. And so it's our fight, our battle, to sort of pry those loose where we can, high and low, right? And so that's sort of our, that's sort of our, our place in the game. I want to just speak to that, actually, because... What essentially protects our ability to get leaked documents is not law. As you pointed out, it's a regulation. It's a policy of the Department of Justice. There is nothing, literally nothing, that would stop a president from enforcing the Espionage Act against a journalist. journalist. And in fact, the government under President Obama has tried to put journalists in prison for talking with sources. So I think it's a very, very fragile environment in which we work. And I would even go a step farther. The only Supreme Court case that has ever really looked at the ability for journalists to do what we do every day is called the Bartnicki case. The Bartnicki case is where a leaked, a, sorry, a, a wiretapped phone call about a, a uh, school board issue was given, literally arrived unbidden over the transom to journalists. And the question was, could you publish illegally gained material? And the answer was yes. But, only, but basically, only if he didn't ask for it. The, the Supreme Court relied on the fact that the journalists had in no way known who did the act or asked or participated in any way in the act. So there is a case to be made that if you ask for classified information, you could be charged with soliciting the, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the information. So I think we, we live in a v much, much more fragile legal system than we understand. Yes, the First Amendment is great for publishing, <coughs> but for news gathering, we do not have nearly as strong a foundation to do, to do our jobs. To whom they lead, but the continuities between the last few administrations have been commonly understood, even by this crowd? I'm not, I'm not totally sure I understood that question. That, that across W and Obama and Trump, there has been a move I toward... think across W and Obama, there was a shared vision about leakers. I don't, I don't have insight into how Donald Trump thinks about that. Good morning. Uh, Jeff Heyman, communications analyst for the city of Lafayette and columnist for the Bay Area News Group. Really simple question, maybe I missed this, but in the end, why didn't Trump, ta Trump Tower Moscow get built? Because he became the president of the United States. And they just dropped so the infomercial didn't work, or it worked too well, so you got elected and they, well. and they couldn't build it, is that it? It worked too well, like really, he became the president and he was like, well, hell, I'll just take over the White House. In fact, it's, it's interesting to me that like, if you talk to the players in this, they all tell me, as soon as he's out of office, they're building that damn thing. They've talked to him. They're like, oh, as soon as he's out, whether that's in 2020 or 2024, 
There's, they're gonna build that tower in Moscow. And he's gonna make a billion dollars and have the last laugh. Somebody up in the back, because we haven't gone there yet. Hi, I have a question. Um, it seemed like there may have been a little bit of a groan when David Lofman talked about the printed document being handed over to the government. Oh, yeah. um, BuzzFeed had a, uh, uh, its own brush with sort of a similar experience. I'm wondering, Mark and Anthony, if you guys could address the uh, FinCEN documents that were shared with BuzzFeed and whether BuzzFeed adequately protected the Treasury official who leaked them to BuzzFeed. Well, thanks. you know, the, the bottom line is that Treasury official may or may not have been a source, but we just don't comment on our sources. Next question. <laughs> That's about right. Yes. Uh, Suzanne, um, a lot of Fred Trump's billions were made by being the favorite contractor of the Brooklyn and, Demo uh, Brooklyn and Queens Democratic Party. Certainly. At a time when it's been reliably reported that they were heavily influenced by organized crime. As you went through the structure of the boiler company and the other contracts of uh, Trump, the Trump Organization, what evidence did you find of collaborations between the Trump Organization and organized crime associated um, agencies like some of the construction unions. And in that context, how does Roy Cohn figure as part of his father's legacy to his son? <laughs> um, we, you know, it's interesting because you mentioned the Trump Organization and we, we, there was some, there was a partner Fred Trump had in the 50s that had connections to organized crime, and we certainly came upon him when we were doing a lot of the property records. We didn't find much beyond that, so, and we didn't extend you know, into the 70s and 80s once uh, you know, Donald was more heavily, obviously, running it by then, so, yeah. So that was sort of the, bit, the, main, yeah, the main intersection. Yeah. Just seeing if anybody in the back wants to ask before we come back down here. Okay, I've got the I've got the mic. Esther Kaplan, Type Investigations. Thanks to all of you for these incredible stories. I, reading them were some bright spots during this period. Um, I, this is a question really for Suzanne and Anthony, I guess. But some of the stuff that had my jaw on the floor in your reporting um, and others is just the scope of criminality in the real estate industry, um, the amount of potential tax fraud, um, money laundering. I, I'm just wondering what, you know, if we can imagine a, a post-Trump presidency where we get to report on other things, but just, you know, what, what, ha, what did you discover there and, and uh, an apparent lack of regulatory and prosecutorial energy focused on that sector. I think you make a really good point that Fred Trump and Donald Trump travel in a world that is certainly um, benefited by tax breaks and you know they push the line and they get a lot from the government. Um, and I think that we certainly, you know, he wasn't the only real estate developer getting tax breaks and, and doing appraisals of buildings that were much, you know, either higher or lower depending on the needs that he had at the time. And we, we stress tested a lot of what we saw with experts to sort of get an advice of where they fell. And our conclusion at the end was very much that they were very aggressive in what they were doing and that they crossed the line where others may, but most would, wouldn't. Most would go up to the line and they went beyond it. I yeah. think um, that's a really brilliant question because it's it, it, what the Trump presidency has done, at least in some small part, is introduce Americans to the word kleptocracy. Right, we all now, my wife now knows, oh my God, I know what an oligarch and a kleptocrat is. And so I think when you're examining, and this is true, it's not a thing that Amer the American audience is really uh, you know, accustomed to knowing about, but so, so in examining his associates, you, you learn th that they are offshoring billions of dollars every day, right? And so for the financial surveillance state, which you know, sort of tracks this stuff, we, we've, un, we've begun to understand how woefully unprepared they are to stop this. That their focus has largely been on stopping the flow of jihadi terror money. And while they were doing that, they missed all of the billions of dollars moving from Eastern Europe and Russia into USD, right? So there's, 
So now that, that I mean, he's president and now sort of that, that sort of thing is in all of our heads and we're beginning to learn more and more about what that looks like uh, in the US. So, I, and, and just to sort of put a little bit of a point on that, uh, the stuff that Manafort was actually indicted for is something that you reported on was the FBI had accumulated yeah. that material. I can't remember now if it's 10, Two, 15 years. Yeah, they had them in 2014. That a source worked on a kleptocracy unit under uh, President Obama. Uh, whole, Eric Holder had developed this team to go track uh, Viktor Yanukovych's money, the former president of uh, Ukraine, and in an agent and an intern basically are over there at this palace picking up his records out of the pool and OCRing them on a handheld scanner. And the source is kind of laughing and saying, it's, it's, it's funny now that everyone wants to talk about Manafort and money laundering and Eastern European sort of offshoring, but we had this guy dead to rights in 2014 and the Obama administration didn't care. They didn't do enough, you know? And so, I mean, that's a very fascinating sort of moment for me that it's, it's, it's very easy to wrap ourselves up into what's happening with Trump, but I think to look historically about what the Obama administration knew and did is also pretty significant. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Mark, I was struck by your comment that you didn't have sufficient insight into the Trump administration's policy or approach toward leaks. No, Trump himself. Trump himself. Well, um, I mean, there is a public record of statements, public statements that both Attorney General Sessions and Deputy Attorney General Ron Rosenstein made in obvious response to withering pressure from the White House uh, to step up the department's approach to leaks. So you have that to look at. And you know, I took my position in late 2014 during the Obama administration. I stuck around until February 2018, so I straddled the first year and change. And I can tell you that um, although we weren't sitting around you know, eating pizza and ice cream during the Obama administration, it was a completely different attitude. Uh, there was withering, relentless pressure brought on us to step up, intensify, do more. Um, that didn't have any substantive effect on how we assessed cases. We didn't make cases that shouldn't have been made. So as a practical matter, we still did our business the same way with all the same prudential considerations that you would expect to be brought to bear, but the culture of it changed dramatically. And I, it's really great to hear that. It's also particularly great to hear that so far, at least, there's been you know, standing up to that. But I would just go back to the fact that there is not a shield law. Like there's the force of law does not protect news gathering in the United States of America. Policy and individuals who held the position that you held and who uh, you know, have been in positions of power in the Department of Justice have essentially been the bulwark against that, I would argue, because there's not a law that you can point to. I, I, I take the point. I don't, it is striking to me that notwithstanding um, that initiative, you know, here we are at year three of the Trump administration, there's been repeated talk of modifying the, um, the media guidelines, and you have a crew in place that you would think would be just saliva dripping to, to do that, and nothing palpable has happened yet. So even this crowd is thinking twice about taking steps that they don't want to be associated with because of its obvious implications for free speech. Right, uh, and that may yeah. hold in year yeah. six, yeah. I don't know. Right. I think we'll have to wait and see. But I really appreciate your, your, your saying that, and I think that gives us all a lot of insight into where the Justice Department is and to where the, the current administration is. Next question. Hi, I'm Alexa, I'm from Air Wars. I have a question uh, about, I'm fascinated by the relationship between information laundering, intelligence, uh, state actors, you know, quote unquote non-state actors. Are there ethical calculations that any of you make when you're publishing raw intelligence, especially uh, in the open source environment that we work in now? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, I think you, take, you, you balance them on, uh, you know, 
sort of, you balance each one on its own merits, right? Um, it, it's hard to say this without revealing, like, sourcing, though. Um, so you want to you wanna do no harm, right? It's never my intention to do, I want to minimize the harm I can do to the people around us, the work that I'm doing, right? Um, and so we take that very, very seriously. We take the, the provenance of materials very seriously, um, their risk to the source, very seriously, and to, to be frank, it's not our intention to do damage to the United States of America. I mean, we're, not, we're not trying to reveal things that do harm the U.S. So I think when, when you receive uh, government documents that you're not supposed to have, you have to balance the public's right to know that, and I, I'll be fair, I, I lean heavily into it, against the damage that it can do uh, to the U.S., to the public, to, 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 to you know, to active investigations, right? So we, we're, we're, we're trying to assess that in, in real time. It can be can, kind of confusing and very complicated, but we think we've done a pretty good job of it. I mean, I've stayed away from the hacked documents. That's not, you know, Paul Manafort's hacked text messages are, exist in the ether. They're salacious. But I never thought that that was something where I want, that's not a reporting alley I want to go down. Um, but when you're, you're talking about um, bank documents on accounts, you know, I, wanna, I don't want to harm anybody, but I think that the public has a right to know this, and I'm going to do everything I can to, to minimize that harm, but to give the public as full an accounting as I possibly can. I, I mean, I've never published intelligence, but along the lines of what Anthony's saying, I mean, that question could apply to a whole range of stories that you would publish, and we always consider the impact, you know, the potential negative impact of what you're going to write to people, individuals, you know, I mean, if it was life and death, that would obviously be very high consideration. We've published stories about ongoing government investigations, as many people have. I mean, the legal, the legal consideration is, is obviously important, whatever the legalities are for us, which we talk to our lawyers about. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, we've written about, uh, we wrote about insider trading investigations that were ongoing that then led to people going out and destroying evidence, and those people were charged with obstruction of justice, and the Justice Department was, you know, complaining uh, about, you know, why are we doing this? Um, but, you know, we tell them beforehand, and we hear them out. If they uh, have a case to make that, you know, we should not publish, we'll listen to them, and we'll make a decision. Uh, Susan Seeger, I'm a First Amendment lawyer at USC um, and uh, UC Irvine and journalist. I think we all want your work to have more impact and you work, at least two of you, with sort of legacy old school media. Have you thought about, and now we live in a very visual world, the internet's a very visual um, and auditory. Have you thought about, I mean, what about listicles about one of your investigative pieces? We never did that. We actually, we, <laughs> or, or like more video, or more video, video. or more, more tweets, yeah, but we, something um, more creative to make it more understandable to the general public. No, and I think the Times has, has really got an ear to that, and we, um, for the story you know, that we did on, on Fred, Tr Fred Trump and the Inherited Wealth, we did, and, and we've been doing it with others, we did do a takeaway um, on that. But the other thing um, that I think, you know, for the story that we did that was incredible is we had just an amazing team working with us on visuals to just really lift that story and make it so accessible. You know, it, it was just unbelievable the work that they did. You know, Annie Mills, who I just love, is here today, works on the daily team. Um, we spent a lot of time and spend a lot of time with them on our stories because, you know, it, people hear taxes and it's sort of not really a story about taxes. It was a story about a father and a son um, and their relationship over decades. And, and but bringing all of that to life, we try to use all the tools at times. And I think the Times is becoming they're doing more and more of, of the, some of the things that you suggested. Because um, you have a journalist who does stuff about music that interviews people you know, on Skype, but it just is very creative and very immediate. I'm talking more about video, because you know, a lot of the charts are also kind of hard to understand as well. So I, just, I hope you get more creative to make it more uh, you know, quick bites to the general public and to have more impact. We also yeah, do yeah. that. I mean, when the story, the story that Mark put up earlier about Trump's involvement in the hush money uh, deals, we rented a, a, a studio or a whole space in Long Island City, brought all the reporters there, put documents and photographs on the table, and walked readers, kind of did a, a, a video version of the story where we explained, showed documents and pictures, 
uh, basically took people through the timeline, um, and it was, it was really effective. We have time for one more question, and I think it's this Hi. gentleman. Um, I'm Steve Toll. Uh, my law firm's involved in two cases against the president and against some members of his campaign. Um, but of your three pieces, at least two of them, it seems, have real criminal potential. I'm not sure the line about the Trump Tower does, although it of course shows he's a liar. But the other two, the question I have and so always wonder about is Alan Weisselberg seems to me might be the key to everything on the two points on election viol campaign violation or tax schemes and any insights into him what he knows or what he'll say or will he say or what's going on in that regard uh, he's a longtime trump employee and i think loyal i mean he did testify in the grand jury there uh i think it's been reported that you know he and michael cohen have divergent uh uh, accounts of what occurred, whether uh, conversations about Stormy Daniels' deal and repaying uh, Michael Cohen for that. So he certainly would have a lot of information, but the question is whether, um, you know, what corroboration is there, essentially. So I, you know, I, but I don't have a window into, I, I don't have the impression that that's an ongoing issue. Maybe just as a point of privilege, as, the, as one of the hosts, I can ask Mark and the others. We haven't mentioned the dossier at all. It's kind of amazing to me that a fundamental document in the reporting has not been discussed. And there were decisions made that are important decisions. And I wonder how this group feels about the dossier today and the decision to publish it with apparently no verification. And maybe that's, that's you'll disagree, but said, I'd be yeah. interested in hearing that. So you guys can say whatever you'd like. Since I was, my byline <laughs> is on that piece, I'm happy to answer any questions. Would you like to? Pontificate first, or would you like me to? Uh, holy crap! <laughs> the Providence and th that that is a f fucked up document. I'm going to say that that is a fucked up document, and um, I think we need to know more about where it came from, why it is, what it means. But I still will defend the right and the decision to publish it because I believe in radical transparency. And if the U.S. government is passing that kind of intel to the president, and the president-elect, I think you guys deserve to know it, right? So I, that's just my two cents on that, is I believe that if it exists and it's being handled in that way, that you guys deserve to know what the hell we're talking about. So that's just my two cents. I, I, I wouldn't take issue with that. I mean, we had the dossier. I wasn't personally involved in, I mean, I had read it before it was published by BuzzFeed, but I wasn't personally involved in the decision, you know, not to publish it. Um, and we don't generally just publish document. I mean, the Wall Street Journal, you know, has a particular set of standards, and we don't generally just put information out online without knowing, you know, what the truth of it is. And I mean, I'm not, I'm not criticizing the decision to do that, but that's generally our practice. So we would have, uh, before publishing something like that, we would have gone through it and tried to learn as much as we could to tell people. Uh, you know, what we can about all the information that's in here before we published it. I, we, we take the same view. I mean, we had it as well, and we're working to verify it. It's hard just to sort of throw thing, you know, throw thing up without knowing whether it's true or not. But on the other hand, I mean, it's an interesting position but just because of the, the, I think, the singular place that that dossier held in terms of how it was being used and, and what was being said about it. But, you know, we also had it and didn't, didn't go to publication, but we're trying to verify it. Um, you know, so. so we were all in the same place until, uh, so let's, let's just back up. The dossier is a series of memos written by a former British spy that allege two basic facts. One is that President Trump was compromised by the Kremlin, which had compromise on him, financial and sexual. And the other is that there was a wide ranging largely internet-based, but not only internet-based, campaign to interfere in the United States election in favor of Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton um, as part of its effort to destabilize Western democracies. Okay? Those are the two basic claims in the dossier. One of those claims is true. When we had the dossier, we also tried to verify its contents. We, this is all public now, so there's no reason to 
hold anything back because it's all public through the lawsuits. Um, we had people go to Prague to see because we thought the most, the simplest thing was did Michael Cohen go to Prague? So we, I don't know how many hundred of hotel rooms or hotels <laughs> Jane Bradley went to, but she got into a lot of them and like some, one person even said, oh, why don't you just look through our computer system? She says, okay. <laughs> At any rate, so we, we did in fact try, try to do it. But then, several, we, we learned more and more things. We learned that the leader of the Democratic, the, the leader of the Senate, the Democratic leader of the Senate, Harry Reid, was making public comments based on this dossier. We learned that the former Republican standard bearer for President of the United States, John McCain, had personally handed it to the director of the FBI. We learned that the intelligence community corroborated one of those two main findings in the, or allegations in the dossier, that of widespread Russian interference in the United States election. And we found out that the president and the president-elect had been briefed on this document. At that point, that document was not just some unverified thing that came in over the transom that like anybody would just throw up on the internet. It had effectively become, as a judge agreed, a privileged document, similar to an indictment or any other document which has gone through a public governmental process. And so we believed that a document that was known to high-ranking members of our Senate, that was known to the president, the president-elect, that actions and words were being made upon this document. And really, the only people in Washington who didn't have it were sort of ordinary Joes and Janes who voted for these people. We felt that it was something that you, the public, should have. And in all my conversations about this, and by the way, I totally accept that there are people who disagree on completely valid principles, but in all the conversations I've had, I've yet to have someone say, you know, I really wish I hadn't seen it. It'd be fine for the others not to see it, but I, I, I really kind of wanted to see it too. And we published it for all the people who felt that they wanted to see it. <laughs>